but the live stream takes just a second until it gets built. So. <laughs> Okay, just let me know when you want me to. No, I will, I will introduce you first. Okay. But the live stream takes just a second until it gets built. So. Hello, good afternoon here in Paris. It's 2 p.m. July 6, uh, day three of our social uh, program of the Brain Bee, International Brain Bee. Uh, and today is uh, my honor to, to introduce uh, Julia Silva, Silva oh, sorry, uh, to our second keynote lecture. And Julia is a, is a researcher here at the Paris Brain Institute. Um, working in social cognition, doing fantastic work and very, very exciting work. He has, she has been recently uh, awarded an ERC to develop this project. An ERC is uh, the most prestigious uh, European grant for doing research. Uh, so don't feel free to ask questions regarding this as well. Uh, so her, her, her path was uh, started here in France and then she went for, for, the, for, uh, for her PhD and then she went to, to the US to the postdoc and she came back here to Paris to our institute where she established her lab to uh, understand the neural mechanisms of social cognitions in, in human and non-human primates. And uh, so again, it's our pleasure, to, my pleasure to introduce uh, Julia. Uh, feel free to post questions on the chat. I'll be happy to, to read those questions at the end. Or of course, uh, keep your questions and, 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 and put those questions yourself uh, with your camera. So once again, thank you again uh, very much, Julia. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to work uh, to talk to you about how agents and uh, in this case um, uh, us humans, but also monkeys are perceiving our social worlds. And uh, so this is here an example of how we are perceiving uh, other agents. So uh, individuals, their actions, their interactions. And at the end, uh, one open question is how do we understand and how we perceive the whole society? So, um, uh, so now I'm working at the Paris Brain Institute, but uh, many things that I'm going to show to you are, um, are things that I worked on at, uh, in New York at uh, the Rockefeller uh, University. Uh, so, um, sorry. Uh, so we actually spend most of our time watching others. This is really our favorite pastime. We do it um, uh, all the time when we are uh, with our families, with our friends, um, on the street when we're walking. But even during our leisure time, when we are reading a book, basically we are uh, trying to understand what others are doing. When we are watching a movie, it's also the same thing. So we are, this is really our favorite um, uh, pastime to, to watch others. And we are actually not the only one who are doing that. So most primates are living in large social groups and it's also their favorite pastime to, uh, to watch their peers and try to understand uh, what they do. And these include the two species I've been working with, which are uh, rhesus macaques and, uh, and humans. Uh, so there are different uh, things that are happening in our brain when we are uh, watching this kind of very complex social scenes. The first one is that we are going to detect faces. We are very, very good at detecting faces and we identify them uh, almost automatically. And we, know, uh, we now know from, uh, uh, from many years that there are specific areas in our brain, which you can see here on the, on the right, um, which are dedicated for face processing. Okay, I will just put uh, a pointer uh, here, sorry. Yes, which are dedicated for, um, for face processing. So this is a human brain seen from, uh, from below. And you can see here this area in, uh, in yellow. Those are areas that are uh, more activated when we are perceiving faces than any other kind of visual objects. And we also know uh, since uh, the, the year 2000 that uh, rhesus monkeys, uh, which have a much smaller brain, have also dedicated and homologous areas which are also dedicated for face processing. So it seems that this is like um, uh, 
cognitive processes that are uh, that are uh, that really have been here for a long time in a, in our primate lineage. Uh, and these areas are not only uh, more activated when we are processing faces, but are even like necessary for processing faces. And we know from patient studies, such as uh, here patient PS, uh, that when these areas are um, uh, have been impaired, so for instance, uh, this patient has been uh, uh, struck by a bus, and she has here um, a hole in her in her brain exactly in this area. Uh, that is processing faces, and she has a condition which is called acquired prosopagnosia, which is that she is not able to recognize other people through her faces. So she doesn't have other impairment. Uh, she she still has um, a normal uh, type of memory. She can recognize other types of objects. She can recognize um, uh, cars and uh, and dogs and everything, but she is not able to recognize faces of other people. And this is something which she says uh, she is suffering uh, a lot socially because uh, she cannot recognize her neighbors. So, uh, um, so she cannot say hello to them on the streets. And she's trying to use, for instance, other kind of, um, of strategies to still be able to relate to others, such as recognizing them uh, from their pets, which she can uh, recognize, uh, or from their, um, from their uh, hairstyle or their moustache and things like that. Uh, and so what is telling us is that these areas are very specific for one uh, specific thing, which is space processing. Uh, so prosopagnosia also exists actually in the, in the regular uh, normal population of people who have not been impaired by, um, by uh, like medically. And this is the case of uh, congenital prosopagnosia and it's happening in uh, some percentage of the population. So, um, so uh, a very famous example is a very famous uh, neurologist uh, named uh, Oliver Sachs who, who passed away um, a few years ago. And uh, he was describing that um, so he was able to be like one of the most famous neurologists, but he was describing that he was not able to recognize people on um, uh, people he knew from their faces. And he's also describing in his very famous books that uh, that uh, he's not even able to recognize himself in the mirror. So um, so and this is also called uh, congenital prosopagnosia. And actually, so a percentage of the population has uh, congenital prosopagnosia, so they naturally are really uh, not very good at recognizing faces. A small proportion of the population are very, very good at recognizing faces, and they are um, tests uh, to, to assess this. And most of us, we are kind of in the middle. Uh, we are rather okay at recognizing uh, faces. And you can actually test how good you are at recognizing faces through different tests, like the Cambridge face memory test or the before they were famous tests. So here are some um, famous people. And uh, for instance, this test is testing how good you are at recognizing people before they were famous, so when they were young. So I don't know if you recognize um, some of them. So here, for instance, it's uh, Madonna or uh, Brad Pitt or um, Orlando Broom or um, Taylor Swift. Um, or uh, uh, Mbappé, who is a famous um, uh, soccer player in France, uh, or Leonardo DiCaprio. So if you got all of them right, uh, you might be a super recognizer and uh, you can work as a profiler, for instance, for Scotland Yard or something like that. Uh, so um, uh, your profile <laughs> might be interesting for this kind of, of work, even though now, uh, it, some, some uh, computers are very, very good at recognizing faces. And this is also, as you know, thanks or uh, because of uh, social networks where um, people were like adding a lot, a lot of, uh, of faces with names and, uh, and neural networks were able, like artificial neural networks were able to learn how to recognize faces in a very uh, optimal manner. Okay, but when we are watching social scenes, we are not only uh, detecting faces, we are also processing actions that individuals are doing. And finally, we are also processing social interactions. And social interactions are very important because we are revealing hidden properties of agents, such as their dominance, feelings, or relationships, for instance. And what we wanted to do is to understand how these different cognitive processes are represented in the brain, both of monkeys and of humans. 
So this is our human brain, which is roughly weighing 1.5 kilograms, and the much, much smaller uh, monkey brain, which is of uh, roughly 80 centimeter cube. So to do that, what we use is a functional magnetic resonance imaging. So it's a large uh, scanner, like a medical scanner, as you, as you might uh, know of. And uh, we are scanning humans or uh, monkeys <clears throat> while they are awake and we are watching videos. Uh, so in order to distinguish between this, disentangle between these different uh, processes, what we did is that we showed naturalistic videos, either of social interactions, of monkeys having actions, or of monkey not acting at all. And what we are measuring in the fMRI is differences in activity in, the, in different brain areas. So we needed a lot of controls to control for everything that we were not interested in in these videos. So for example, <clears throat> we were not interested in the color, the motion, or the contrast in these videos. So we use the exact same videos that we scrambled. Uh, and so they have the exact same color, uh, motion, and contrast, and, and, mo and motion. <coughs> we were also not interested in the fact that there is a complex background in these videos. So as contrast, we use videos which are landscapes, which are very, um, uh, very complex, either full screen or split screen, in order to mimic how we presented these videos on the top. Sorry. Finally, we were also not interested in, um, in uh, the fact that there are two entities in the front that are either moving together, moving separately or not moving. And in order to control for that, we showed also videos with objects that were either moving together, physically interacting, moving separately or not moving. <coughs> so here you can see these videos. So here in the first uh, column, you can see the naturalistic videos of monkeys that we showed to, uh, to other monkeys. You can see here the scrambled version of these videos. So you can see that they are moving in the exact same manner. In this column, you can see here a red dot. And this dot is representing the eye of the monkey that is watching these videos. And uh, we were actually very interested in that because we wanted them to, to really look freely at these videos and to engage uh, with the videos. And what we can see is that they are looking a lot at the faces, at actions that are happening, and they are jumping their gaze from one individual to the other. We analyzed all of this. Uh, so we analyzed all the um, uh, movement, the ocular movement that uh, monkeys were doing. We also analyzed all the motion in the video. And we also used all of this information that we were not uh, really interested in um, as controls in our uh, in, uh, in our mathematical model that we use to analyze these videos. So with all of that, uh, we were able to find where in the brain uh, monkeys are watching or, or processing uh, agents, actions, social interactions, and even physical interactions between objects. And we did that by comparing the activity for one video with uh, activity uh, of all of the other videos that were uh, used as controls. So first of all, what about agents? So for agents, we saw that uh, monkeys are engaging areas here in the superior temporal sulcus and in the frontal cortex. And these areas are actually uh, probably reminding you the one that I showed you at the very beginning for face processing. And indeed, it's located in the same areas for face processing and also um, uh, located in the nearby areas for body processing, which are right next to uh, face processing areas. So these areas are really areas that uh, we are using to understand who is represented on the, on the, on the, on the screen. Um, so uh, when monkeys are watching monkeys that are not acting, even if it's like in a natural setting, we're engaging this classical face and, uh, and body areas. So what happens when we are watching actions? So then this time we are also activating these areas, but we are also activating another set of areas here in the parietal cortex and in the premotor cortex. And this was interesting because these areas are not purely visual areas. On the contrary, we are rather in the motor pathway. And uh, this is something that has been known for um, since the 1992 year. 
and which has been discovered by the group of um, Rizzolatti in, uh, in Italy. We found that in these areas of the motor, uh, of the motor uh, regions of our, uh, of our brain, there are neurons which we called mirror neurons. Uh, so the way they, they have found them was that they were actually studying uh, motor commands of, uh, of monkeys, and they were watching the, um, uh, they were recording neurons when monkeys were grasping uh, peanuts on a, on a plate. And, uh, and they were seeing that these neurons are really, uh, are really following the, uh, the motor command of the monkeys to, to grasp a, a peanut. But they were really uh, very surprised when one day, uh, so, sorry, it's here when the, the monkey is grasping itself. But they were, they were really surprised when one day, one of the researchers um, grasped the, the peanut himself and the monkey was not doing any motor movement, but the neuron still fired. And so they were very surprised by that because at first it was supposed that uh, these areas were really processing uh, motor commands. And here the monkey was not doing any motor command. And, uh, but the monkey was watching someone having a, a doing a motor command. So we call these neurons mirror neurons and it really changed our way of, uh, of understanding how we are processing actions of others. Um, and what these researchers found is that um, uh, we are not only analyzing visual actions of others um, with our visual system, but we are even mapping the, um, uh, the motor actions of others on our own motor system. And these are called the mirror neurons. So we wanted to see if those areas that we see are localized in these mirror uh, neuron areas. So we also, uh, devise the task to, to map where these areas are located in the monkey brain. So we show to the monkeys uh, humans that were, um, that were um, uh, grasping objects. And uh, we found that indeed it's located in very similar areas in the parietal and the premotor cortex. So what we have shown is that when monkeys are watching uh, actions that are performed by naturalistic actions performed by other monkeys, this is, uh, um, this is engaging areas that are overlapping with the mirror neuron system. So areas that are uh, engaged in how something is, uh, is being done. And finally, uh, we were interested by something that has not been studied at that time, which is uh, social interactions. So what, uh, so what are the brain areas that monkeys are engaging when they're watching social interactions? So they do activate all these areas for face and body perception. They also activate areas for, for the mirror neuron system, but they also activate another set of areas, uh, which includes the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, the temporal pole, the medial prefrontal cortex, and the parietal junction, as well as some areas here in the amygdala and caudate. So first of all, what we see is that, um, that the, the monkey brain is really in interested in extracting social information from interaction because many extra areas are, are activated. And the second thing is that these areas that are activated are uh, pretty peculiar. So why are they peculiar? So first of all, uh, they are pretty peculiar because what we found was that uh, they were activated only by these videos of social interactions and they were not activated compared to baseline or they were even deactivated to all other kinds of videos. And this is something that we don't see very often with fMRI in the visual cortex. So for instance, in the face areas, uh, there is like a lot of activation for faces, but there is still some activations for cars or bodies or, or hands, for instance. Here, what we see is that there is no activation or even a deactivation. And this reminded us of, um, of another network in the brain that is well known in humans, uh, which is called the default mode network. So this is um, um, a network in our human brain, uh, which is deactivated when we are doing like, a, a, like, a, like cognitive tasks that are very demanding and which is activated when we are mind wandering or like um, daydreaming. Um, or when we are thinking about uh, other people. And this is where it starts to be uh, interesting for us. Um, so this is what I was telling you. So this network is also activated when us humans, we are thinking about other people. And when we are thinking about the intentions of other people, which is something that is called theory of mind. And those areas that we have found were located in homologous areas with theory of mind. Um, 
So uh, a little bit about theory of mind. So this is when we are thinking about other people's intentions, beliefs, or knowledge that are motivating their, uh, their behaviors. <clears throat> and this is often tested with a test, which is called the false belief test. So I will show you this test uh, uh, now. So, um, so in order to test for theory of mind, uh, what people can do is that they can use puppets. Uh, why? Because it's often tested in children, because theory of mind is developing over the, the ages. So first, it's not really present, and then it starts to be present later on in, the, uh, in child development. So here you have two puppets, Sally and Anne. And uh, what we, the little story that we are saying is that Sally has a, a piece of chocolate and she's hiding this piece of chocolate in the basket and then she moves away. And then Anne, uh, the tricky Anne, she takes the chocolate and she puts it in the other, uh, in the other box. And then Sally is coming back. And the question that is asked to the children is, where is Sally going to look for the chocolate? Is she going to look uh, in the basket where she put it in the first place, or is she going to look for it in the box where it uh, actually is? And so now I'm going to show you the response of, uh, of the children. Okay. Ah, sorry. No, so this is not playing. <clears throat> mm. Okay. This is Anne and this is Sally. This is Sally in Anne's basket and box. And one day, Sally and Anne were playing with a block in their house. And then Sally decided to put the block in the box. Then she decided to go outside and play where she couldn't see or hear anything, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, Anne, that tricky Anne, decided to take the block and put it in the basket. Now, since Sally is outside, did she see Anne move the block? No, she didn't, did she? So when Sally comes inside, where will she think the block is? She thinks it's in there. Why will she think it's in there? It's in there. Okay. So here at 32 months, she, she is not uh, succeeding. This is Anne, and this is Sally. And these are Sally's basket, Anne and Sally's basket and box. And guess what? One day, Anne and Sally were playing with a block in the house. And then Sally decided to put the box block inside the box. And then Sally decided to go outside and play where she couldn't see or hear anything that was happening inside. Bye, Sally. Well, that tricky Anne, guess what she did? She took out the She box. took the block and put it in basket. Now, did did Sally see Anne move the block? Uh-uh, because no. she was outside. That's right. Swinging. That's right. She didn't see. So when Sally comes back in, what? where will she think the block is? Um, in, in, in there, but it's not. It's in there. So she'll think it's in the box. Yeah, Why she, do you think she'll think that? Um, okay. She put it there. Okay, so now at 52 months, you can see that uh, uh, children are able to, to do uh, the theory of mind uh, uh, task. But what you can see is that it's a pretty complicated uh, task and, uh, and it requires a lot of, um, uh, well, in, uh, at least in, uh, in, in uh, humans, we are using language to explain the task and so on. And so we know that uh, humans are passing the false belief task. And we also know that they have these areas for uh, theory of mind. Uh, however, for resource macaques, 
Until now, it has been thought that they have more limited theory of mind uh, capacities. So they know some of the of the knowledge that others have, but they are not very good at. Um, uh, well, some studies have found that they are not very good at uh, understanding the intentions and the beliefs of others. However, what we have found was that because these areas which are uh, homologous to, um, to, to humans are activated, uh, maybe processing social interactions could be a precursor of our own uh, human aptitude of theory of mind. So since then, um, there, is, uh, there are other uh, research that has shown that, uh, uh, that first of all, uh, humans are not the only ones who are able to do a theory of mind task. So um, uh, most of uh, great apes are passing the, the false belief test, including the chimpanzees, uh, bonobos, and also orangutans. Um, uh, then there is another step, uh, another kind of uh, evidence that has uh, emerged. So in resource macaques, for other tasks that have been done, which are called uh, implicit theory of mind task or um, uh, yeah, implicit uh, theory of mind where researchers have tracked the gaze of the monkeys and they found that monkeys would still look longer at uh, the box where, um, where the, the other monkey thinks that the, that the piece of chocolate is. And um, they also inactivated one of the area, which is very close to uh, the area that we have found here with fMRI. And they found that this behavior is, um, that this uh, inactivation is removing this behavior of looking more at, uh, at this area. So it's, uh, it's impairing um, implicit uh, theory of mind. And finally, um, uh, in marmosets monkeys, which are even like further uh, away from us in the primate lineage, it has been found that um, uh, marmosets monkeys are also activating the same set of uh, areas that we have found in uh, rhesus macaques when marmosets monkeys are watching social interaction between their peers. So it seems that uh, theory of mind might have like uh, long precursors in the, um, in the primate lineage that might be related to how we're processing social interactions between their, their peers. Uh, so to, uh, to first uh, conclude on this part, so we found that um, there are different cognitive processes that are happening in our brain when we're watching social scenes. So first uh, we're uh, processing agents. And to do that, we are activating face and body areas. They are telling us about who is on the, on the screen. Uh, then we're watching actions. We are processing actions. And for that, we are um, activating an extra set of areas, which is the mirror neuron system, which is informing us of on uh, uh, how an action is being uh, done. And finally, we are also processing social interactions. And for that, we are activating yet another uh, set of um, areas, which is this proto theory of mind uh, network, which may be telling monkeys, um, at least to a certain extent, why uh, their peers are doing something. Uh, so then on, in the next part, I'm just going to quickly tell you that what we did next in humans. So we wanted to compare the strategies of monkeys and, uh, and humans. Uh, so uh, this is us uh, humans, and uh, these are the rhesus macaques. And you can see that we evolved separately for 25 uh, millions of years. And so this is our last uh, common ancestor. So we had time to, uh, to, to really evolve, to, to have different uh, neural strategies in the two species. So in order to compare at best between monkeys and humans, what we did was to scan a subject in an fMRI in the same manner, and they were watching videos also. We showed them the exact same videos of monkeys, the exact same videos of objects. And this time we also showed them videos of humans that were either not acting, acting, or socially interacting. So the first question that we asked was, OK, so when we are watching agents that are not doing anything, are we also activating face and body areas? And the short answer is yes, we do. But actually, we are also activating very spontaneously the theory of mind network. Uh, even when we are watching people who are not doing anything, just like sleeping on the, on the bench or, uh, or uh, just uh, looking around, uh, we are already activating this, uh, this network. So this was our um, first result that we're really not expecting. And then uh, when we are watching actions and social interactions, what are the networks that we are uh, activating? So 
we do activate the same network. So both uh, networks for um, um, of, for face and body processing, the network for theory of mind, and this time we're also activating the mirror neuron system, both for actions and social interactions. So similarly to what uh, we found in, uh, in monkeys. And finally, as I uh, showed you, for, um, for, uh, for humans, we showed both videos with humans and with, those with monkeys uh, agents. And we thought, okay, so maybe there are differences in how we are processing videos with monkeys and with those with humans, because we have much, much more expertise with humans than with monkey agents. And uh, indeed, we found that there are many areas where uh, that are more activated when we are watching other humans performing tasks than when we are watching other monkeys performing certain tasks. But actually, when we break it down to the type of, um, of tasks, um, of social scenes that we are presenting, we found that most differences are actually when we are watching actions. So um, most of these areas are much, much more activating when we are watching humans performing tasks with objects compared to when we are watching monkeys performing tasks with, uh, with objects. Uh, so we were not expecting that. We, we thought that we would see uh, uh, bigger differences in social interactions um, or even in agents not doing anything or like <laughs> the same in the three categories. But we are not expecting that we would see this difference mainly in these um, in these uh, action videos. And it's also something that we saw in, uh, in the report. So we were then asking people to tell us what they thought about the videos that they showed. And all of them told us that they were very interested by um, uh, watching others that were interacting with, uh, with objects. So there might be a peculiar human interest in understanding peers' actions of an object, maybe because we are using objects as tools in our everyday life. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a possibility. Uh, so to conclude, we found that um, uh, resource monkeys, similarly to humans, are engaging their face and body areas, the mirror neuron system, and also that there is a precursor of the theory of mind network in monkeys. Uh, however, we found that contrary to monkeys, humans are spontaneously engaging this theory of mind network, even when we are watching non-acting monkeys, uh, non-acting agents. And we have this specifically strong activation when we are watching peers' actions directed towards uh, objects. Uh, so now I'm just going to show you what we are doing now. So, uh, so as I told you, we know uh, now a little bit about how faces are processed in the brain. We know how social interactions are processed in the brain. And our next question is now how the whole social network is, uh, is represented in the, in the brain. And to study that, we are collaborating with um, uh, with a group um, uh, of ethologists who are uh, following a group of uh, semi-free-ranging monkeys. And what we are doing is that we are, um, uh, we are establishing, ah, yes, yeah, sorry. We are establishing all the, the friendship relationship, the social network of these, uh, of these animals. So we are looking at how much we're interacting with each other, what kind of interactions we are having, for instance, uh, whether it's affiliated interactions such as grooming, um, they, they love grooming each other and things like that. And with that, we can see who is friend with whom. And from this, uh, we are going to try to understand how this is represented in the brain, both all the social distances between these animals, which are the animals that are more central in the group, how this is perceived, um, however, um, uh, however, um, kinship is represented in the in the brain. So, uh, who is um, uh, yeah? How we are like the um, who are the parents of whom? Who are the children of whom? And also the hierarchy that is governing the the um, uh, the, the group. Uh, so, with this, I thank you for your attention. I would like to thank all the people who um, participated in this project, both at um, the Rockefeller University and here at the Paris Brain Institute. And I'm very happy to take um, uh, any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, so the floor is open for questions. And while people are thinking their questions, I, I might have a few ones uh, first. <clears throat> first of all, you know, uh, it's well, thank you for the fascinating presentation. And, and, and you know, we all focus lot on primates and our cousins, the, the uh, monkeys. But I'm wondering in other 
uh, parts of the animal kingdom uh, in like other mammals. Is, is there like uh, evidence of a uh, theory of the mind or or a similar type of uh, representation of social networks or or uh, like this? Um, yeah. So um, yeah. So about theory of mind. So there are some studies in um, in birds. There are uh, many studies in birds. So um, one thing about theory of mind is that you may to think about what, what other people are thinking and then mm -hmm. adapting your behavior, behavior to that. And there are some birds that are having this kind of behavior that they're, um, that they're catching their, um, their food. So they take their food and they put it in a place where they know that the other are not going to look at, um, at um, where they are not going to search uh, this food there. So uh, they are doing this kind of um, inferences about uh, what the other birds know about um, where my food uh, well, is. So, um, so this is the case, for instance, with uh, corvids. And mm -hmm. corvids actually have a very big brain. They have a brain of the size of a chimpanzee. So uh, which- Relative or, or absolute? No, Sorry? relative. Relative to their body. No, 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 absolute. Absolute. Yeah, yeah, they have a, yeah. Uh, so yeah, they have a really big brain. So, and we have many corvids in the, in Paris. And now I just yeah, see yeah, they are, they are, another they are, eye <laughs> completely. That's scary. <laughs> yes. We are also doing many other very interesting behaviors, such as um, uh, in Japan, it has been shown that they take notes and they like, um, uh, they are flying over, um, uh, places where cars are rolling and they just uh, put the nuts, like they, <laughs> they let the nuts fall there for the cars to crush their nuts and then they're uh, eating the nuts. They know how to use many tools. So uh, so yes, I think theory of mind is not only something that is, um, uh, yeah, that happens in, in primates, but to better understand our uh, theory of mind, uh, the best thing is to understand it in uh, in other primates to understand how it uh, how it is encoded in our brain. But it's possible that there is like convergent evolution and that uh, other uh, other. Well, it's emergence, independent emergence, no? Like it systematically emerged later in time. It's. Uh, yeah, yeah. That uh, yes, that there is parallel uh, emergence. Yes, 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 yes. So, questions from the students? Do we have one? Come on, don't be shy. I have more questions myself, but I would rather have like yours, your questions. Uh, take advantage. You can always like uh, ask questions outside the topic and, and ask her about her career path or whatever. Ah, uh, yes, I'm happy to answer anything. Okay. So why we they gain a bit of uh, of uh, of, uh, of energy? Uh, no, so you mentioned like the prosopagnosia and the people who are also able to to, to be super recognizers. Uh, I, I assume that those type of you know distributions in terms of a, a psychological uh, capacity are also expressed in terms of the way we uh, interact with objects and with other humans uh, with other uh, agents. Mm -hmm. So it's a description as well of uh, distributions. And, and I guess we can all, all think of people who are super social and people who are like very like socially awkward, awkward. but uh, is there like uh, something you could add on, the, on that domain? Yes, yeah, so, um, so actually, so people who have prosopagnosia, they say that they have different strategies. So some of them say that it's true that uh, they are perceived by others as being uh, uh, not very nice because we are not responding on the street, that they are just... Uh, uh, yeah, not very nice. So, and sometimes they themselves like put uh, themselves outside of the of the social network. They tend to like just not look at others like very directly to 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 not uh, to not interact directly with them. But others have completely different strategies. So, and this is uh, the case of Oliver Sacks. So his strategy was to be uh, very nice with everyone. So because he was assuming that he doesn't know if he knows that person or not, uh, he was just, uh, yeah, he tried to, to be like uh, super social. So you can have like the two types of, um, of uh, yeah, strategies that- so That's interesting have. because it creates a dissociation between the, the, your capacity to recognize faces and your capacity to, to, to join a social network. Um, but uh, about, I'm wondering like, you know, if you can have like the opposite uh, uh, dissociation, meaning that 
um, meaning that uh, the, your capacity to die to join a, a, a social network, to to be part of a social, a social network or not, and you know there are pathologies that are associated to to lack of theory of mind, like autistic uh, traits. Um, if they have if they have uh, on the same side on the same on the same hand like difficulties on, on prosopagnosia or, or these are completely dissociated. Like the two networks are completely dissociated. So, so you show the dissociation from one to the other is a dissociation as well from the social properties to the to the capacity to identify uh, individuals yeah so actually it's two different things so uh, autism and prosopagnosia and because yeah, prosopagnosia is not very well known some people who has prosopagnosia can be misdiagnosed as um, autistic but actually they're not autistic they're uh, prosopagnosic and uh, but uh, there are also people who have um, both so i met um, uh, autistic uh, um, uh, people in uh, in Lyon in a in a center that is uh, um, engaging uh, people with autism to um, uh, like to to try to also ask uh, uh, research questions related to autism and uh, and we discussed a lot about that and some had both uh, prosopagnosia and autism and some had uh, uh, just autism but without uh, prosopagnosia and actually people who are like super recognizers sometimes they also say that for them it's also difficult because uh, they they can be seen as uh, stalkers or um, uh, things like that because they, rec they remember everyone so for instance they go to the subway and they remember everyone that is in the subway and then like um, like a week after they can see that person on the street and uh, and they can go to that person and say ah yes you are taking the subway on that day with me i remember you and so people are also saying oh this is super awkward and so um, so we know about that that they so, so it's, uh, they're not especially gifted in terms of memory. It's just the fact that uh, they remember that those. Um, yeah, it's like a mem well, memory for faces. Yeah. Amazing. So we have a question. Thank you, Isabella. Uh, yes. Happy to, to put the question for you. So she's asking whether monkeys can recognize human faces. Ah, yes, yes. So a uh, very good question. And actually, so at first it was um, more easy for um for human researchers to show uh, to to manipulate human faces because we are better at recognizing uh, human faces and what they did was to first show human faces to um, uh, to uh, to monkeys and they sh they have seen that monkeys are a they they distinguish between the human faces uh, very well um, but they didn't know what what was not known is whether they identified the people on the on the on the screen as a person that they know. And so this is a study that uh, I, I did during my PhD actually. So what uh, I wanted to understand whether monkeys would individually recognize um, other humans, but also other monkeys. This was also, has never been uh, studied. And so what we did for that was that we showed uh, both, we wanted to see if they make the link between the voice of an individual and the face of a given individual. And so we presented different, um, a certain voice and then different faces of well-known individuals and we looked at whether we are going to look longer for instance at a face that corresponded to the voice and uh, we have shown that yes it is the case and this showed that they have also like this uh, individual recognition both for uh, for monkeys but also for uh, for humans excellent so now we have a question from calvin from australia and he's asking, why do we have a special brain area for faces, but not for other body parts? Yeah, so um, so we have also areas that are specific for um, body parts in general, but it's basically everything but the face. So uh, so it's um, so it's a little bit uh, strange, uh, but um, but actually those so. At first, yes. So, uh, so, but this has been shown with um, with a help fMRI, uh, which is um, so with fMRI we don't we don't exactly see what each neuron is doing, and so there is like a, uh, with uh, electrophysiology we have a better uh, granularity, and we can look at each neuron in these areas, and we see that some neuron prefer uh, hands, and some neuron prefer like other body parts. So, um, but they are more like entangled in these areas. And so why faces are so um, peculiar, maybe because we are using them first to identify people. We identify people a lot by their, by their faces, much more than by their body. 
uh, and body postures are actually more used for um, other things. We, we, uh, yes, we are actually processing bodies more to understand, um, yeah, like the emotion or the motion of a person or things like that. And this is something that we can extract from the whole body part, like the whole body and not uh, just specific parts. Okay, thank you, Julia. So um, I will have another question. Oh, so Karin says thank you, and also Isabella from Italy says thank you for for your answers. So I will post another question myself. I'm going to ask you another question, and 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 students, if you have more, uh, I'm happy to take them. Uh, um, you know, it's it's well described our our specialization. Uh, to identify faces or a niche on or niche of like uh, of uh, of social niche, like say um, people who are in in in, in our uh, country, etc., or, or in, in they are similar to us uh, uh, in in terms of uh, color, body color, or 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 or, um, or genetically are closer to us. Uh, so it, like socially, we're more more. Well, less precise when it comes to other other um, other 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 people. Uh, so I'm wondering if there are like some also regionalization within monkeys, and if the monkeys have more difficulties to 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 identify uh, uh, external uh, individual from the group. Ah, okay. Like all the externals are externals, and mm -hmm. and and they, you don't make you don't make like lots of distinct uh, distinctions between them, or or they can also because I was surprised the fact that uh, that the monkeys can you know identify us in like with precision, while I I I'm not sure we be able to identify the monkeys with precision. Who, yes, monkey is is which? Uh, yeah, so the monkeys. Is, yeah. <laughs> So this is uh, also something that is not uh, genetically uh, ingrained. The fact that we are better at uh, recognizing, for instance, um, people from your own ethnicity. It's mm. uh, not uh, something that is due to uh, the fact that you have a certain ethnicity. It's due to, um, it's due to, um, to how you have been raised. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, so if you have been raised in a, in a, in an environment that is uh, very multicultural, like uh, I don't know in New York or in uh, Paris, uh, then you you um, you you will be like uh, seeing people for like uh, from different many uh, ethnic groups, and then you will be just as good for um, for any kind of uh, of ethnic groups. And there is like kind of a um, uh, yes, very like. And this is really happening during uh, when you're a child. Yeah. Uh, and at first, actually, children are, are very, very good at any kind of uh, faces. Children are even good at, uh, human children are even good at recognizing monkey faces. Uh, so they can very well just distinguish as well two monkey faces from as uh, two uh, uh, human faces uh, from each other. And uh, they are losing that in time. And uh, there is one researcher who actually um, Olivier Pascalis, he was showing like a little book with a lot of monkey faces to children uh, because this is the case until they were like six months old and he continued to show this book. He asked uh, parents to show a little book with, um, uh, with um, faces of rhesus monkeys to children between six months and one year old and they retained like their, uh, their ability to discriminate between uh, monkey faces, rhesus monkey faces, like at the same level as uh, human monkey faces. So, um, so it's really something that, so we are kind of uh, born with this uh, ability yeah. to discriminate between them. these patterns like very well. And then we are losing it and we are like specializing for like the group we are living in with and uh, we are losing this ability for uh, other groups. So this is the first thing. And then, um, yes, for rhesus monkeys. So then rhesus monkeys, yes, so they, they have this ability to, uh, to know who is in your group and uh, in their group and outside their group. And then uh, they also have expertise, the one that we tested with human faces or uh, monkeys that, um, that, uh, that they, they know they are uh, yeah, working with humans and so on. So, so they know humans well. So, and uh, and and um, I wonder, like, if because you said that's a critical period, etc. Mm -hmm. So, you think that this uh, the rhesus monkeys have the ability to identify human faces on the wild, or is just because like they are exposed to humans uh, in the lab? So I think it it probably is the same as uh, as um, uh, as humans. So they probably have this ability 
at the beginning and then they will lose it uh, if they don't continue to um, to be uh, like with humans and uh, and they would have it just for monkeys yeah. calvin from australia has another question and he's asking whether humans can do something to improve their ability to identify faces ah uh, yes that's a good uh, question so <coughs> yeah what can you do to uh, improve your ability to identify so at first people thought that um uh that that actually uh people who are not very good at um, identifying faces they would be better at identifying other through their voices uh, because you know that you can identify other like if your phone is ringing and you you talk through the phone you 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 can identify the voices of people and they thought that we would be better but actually they realized that uh, it was not the case that um, there is like this multi-sensory um, uh, yeah that there is like a multi-sensory enhancement of your learning so um, the, if you are better at recognizing uh, the two together uh, you will be better for both of uh, them so uh, if you train, maybe you could train like uh, to see more uh, faces with voices and then you could uh, become better at both recognizing uh, faces and voices. But I don't know if our trainings for, um, uh, uh, for being better at uh, identifying faces or not. Um, if you're not uh, good at identifying faces, it's, uh, it's totally fine. Uh, you can tell that to your friends. I have a lot of friends who are not good at identifying faces, and uh, it's not, uh, yeah, it's not a problem. Uh, it's just uh, how, how they are, and uh, others are very good, and uh, it's also okay. So, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Julia. It was a very exciting uh, presentation and, and questions. Um, <laughs> so. I think with this, we are closing the, the, the session of today, all the organs. Uh, let's uh, double check this. Um, yes. Yes. It was Thank the last session for, of yes. the day. And, uh, and I don't know if uh, you, are not, uh, you have uh, any announcement uh, to make. No, not at this moment. Yeah. See everyone tomorrow uh, in the next session. And thank you very much to Julia Sliva for a very, very uh, good presentation and very interesting topic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you all for your, your, yeah. your and presence. good luck for the everyone to the for the to the competition. Yeah. <laughs>